I, I, I really think we're going to have a fun time here. <laughs> book launches, whatever the nature of a book should be, fun things. And this book is a damn serious account of internationalism, of youngsters, young men and women in their 20s, students and workers, trade unionists, who we got to go to South Africa in uh, the period of the mid-60s to the early 70s. And that particular period was when the underground of our liberation movement, whether of the Communist Party, ANC, uh, or our military wing, were absolutely devastated by, for those um, with the long memories, the Ravonia trial, Mandela had been arrested the year before, captured, and then Susulu and a host of others captured in a raid on the Ravonia farm where the headquarters was. And in a couple of years following, the attempts to revive the underground were all beaten back with people like uh, Wilton and Kwai, who took over the leadership of our armed wing, and then Bram Fischer, leading uh, communist in South Africa, an absolutely great man, uh, arrested as well, and their networks were smashed. There I was, quite a young guy, just a few years older than the, the recruits to be, and I'm in London, um, coming there from the ANC's headquarters in Dar es Salaam, and joining uh, three incredible people, Joe Slovo, Yusuf Dadu, and Jack Hodgson. And they were part of the people who had managed to escape, just as I had, and were now in London. And we were analysing this awful situation and what to do. And like all good revolutionaries, the question is, how do we speak to our people? How do we get the message across? Um, we just had to show that we still were alive, even though we might have been abroad, but getting material through to South Africa and having it spread would show that something is alive there. The hopes of the people should not be dashed. The crowing of the security police and their racist government needed to be answered. I, I don't want to go in too long here in the 12 minutes allocated for the amount of analysis that went in to what should be done at that immediate point in time. And this was discussions from Oliver Tambo and the ANC headquarters in Dar es Salaam and this remnant of the Communist Party actually and some ANC people in London. Four of us were together in Good Street just down the road. We've just had a, uh, a guided tour um, of the area with a number of people and some of the recruits talking about it. Gooch Street, office dilapidated, mouldy Gooch Street of the 60s, just straight out of a Graham Greene novel. Nothing like the sort of boutique places you see today. And we up rickety steps, and then Yusuf Dadu's secret office, you know, an anonymous office there, these three older guys, and this young kid, and the analysis has been, we've got to do something, we've got to get the uh, material in, we've, we need smugglers, we need activists who are going to take in the literature, smuggle it in, and then post it in the first place. Later we develop leaflet bombs and other gadgets. Right, that is the decision. We're going to do it. Joe Slova, right, on the agenda, what is to be done? One, recruits. Recruits. Three pair of aged eyes swivel around and look at this young guy there. <laughs> Me. Yes, register at the London School of Economics. Develop your links with the Young Communist League and all the lefties around. Fine, I are, you know, lovely, actually, quite a challenge. Jack Hodgson was going to create all the James Bond type devices. I mean, our, our, our uh, suitcases uh, with the false bottoms, uh, state of the art, circa <laughs> 1965. You know, a nine inch suitcase inside to a depth of six inches. We put in fancy paper to dazzle the eyes. And I used to give these 
these suitcases to people going in, and they'd say, good God, what have you got in here? And you said, wait, five kgs empty. You know, like 10 pounds empty. They had to cram it full of their clothing and go in. We, we, we uh, organized them for this. And I want to say that the response to the search for, uh, for these agents of ours uh, was absolutely incredible. I've met up with people like Ted Parker, John Rose, George Pazis, and others at the London School of Economics, very involved in Vietnam, very involved in anti-apartheid and, and other activities of the time. French Revolution coming up any day, 1968 and so on. And also through George, um, George over here, George Bridges, and then Bob Allen, who were London district secretaries of the Young Communist League. Um, are you guys for this? Can you, can you, can you help us, etc.? So there I was, the known Stalinist and only Communist Party member at the LEC, I would say in those days, known as the Stalinist. I didn't hide my <laughs> support for the Soviet Union. And we used to read Stalin. <laughs> <laughs> working with all these wonderful trots, and we got on very well. That's on the one side. And then on the other side, I was with the British Communists, the Young Communist League, neither knowing, because it was only on need to know that you went out, who the hell was going in. It would be a question of explanation, what it was about, would you help? And I must say, you would imagine that the YCLers would be absolutely ready to help the bourgeois nationalist ANC, uh, which was what it was really about, or the communists. The IS people of the time were absolutely quite clear, and John can explain this, that yes, of course, they, they, they would do this in terms of the anti-apartheid cause. So we managed to recruit them on that basis. And over the five years, in the period before we could really reorganize our underground with our own people, they did what Tabo Mbeki said recently, it was his 70th birthday, half a dozen of these guys were in South Africa, and they came to that event, and he turned his speech into praise for the London recruits, who of course came from America to Ireland, Mike Malotta over here, it was great to see him with his, his wife, um, and uh, all over Britain, the Netherlands, France, Greece, uh, not just George, but a few others, and his uncle he recru recruited on the spot in South Africa. When I said to these guys, don't reveal yourselves to anybody. <laughs> yes, he went and stayed at his family's hotel in Ellis Park, where the rugby stadium is, and immediately recruits his uncle, which was a great <laughs> thing that actually happened. There were things like that that would have made me absolutely scream in astonishment at the way they... They broke certain aspects of the rules, which were okay. The Bell Brothers, charming YC Ellers, love the ladies. I told them, nothing, nothing on in South Africa. You just, these white tourists, and you don't put a foot wrong. They were in a hotel in Cape Town. Cape Town's full of beautiful young colored women, many who in a place like Britain, you wouldn't think were any different to whites. And there they were, they are supposed to be reconnoitering the town, and they take these two charming hotel uh, people who staff to, to some club and it gets raided and these two women are dashing for the toilets and they got out of the, the windows and ran back to the hotel. These guys said, what, what was going on? They explained, well, can't you see we colours, didn't you know? So it, it was stuff like this, Danny Schachter from America, Danny don't do anything to draw attention to yourself, blah, blah, blah. So he goes into his hotel, he runs a bath, the bath overflows <laughs> while he's snoozing, the hotel going crazy, and they get all the black guys, you see our comrades from South Africa know all about this, to mop it up. But Danny, like a good American progressive, rolls up his trousers, gets the mop, and he's down on the floor mopping. And they say, gee, boss, we never knew white guys could do this. Don't call me boss. <laughs> <laughs> I, let, let me finish by saying that 
the impact they made on South African, black South Africans, these things were put at key points around the country, simultaneously in all the main cities, five cities at a particular hour on a particular day. Um, they obviously could have guessed, well, maybe others were doing something, but they didn't know. And these things worked brilliantly. Um, a street broadcast apparatus was blaring out Cape Town Railway Station, and a Rhodesian policeman retired uh, says to the papers, and the papers were loving all of this taking place, says, I have seen excited natives in my time in Rhodesia. I'm retired now. I didn't expect to see excited crowds of <coughs> natives as I saw at the railway station listening to a broadcast. And they just went wild and wild with joy. Uh, a street broadcast, a bomb blast rather, a, a bucket bomb, went off as a policeman was fiddling with it. And the photographers were there because these guys left this device outside the, the, the newspaper office. And that was front page photograph, two years running in South Africa's main newspapers. It made a huge impact, hence the kind of statement uh, that Tabo Mbeki and others made when these young people were out, old pensioners now, and they saw the appreciation shown to them in South Africa today for their internationalism, for their solidarity. So this book, compiled by Ken Keeble, he managed to collect all the stories of 35 of these young men and women. Uh, it's great reading, and they explain their motivation for accepting this, what South Africa was like at the time, and what their particular um, missions were. It was dangerous, and we made that clear to them. Let me finish by saying that two got caught out of possibly in the five years at least 50 to 60 went in. <clears throat> and the one was Sean Hosey, who we hope would be with us tonight, uh, young Irishman as the name indicates, and he was caught and sentenced to five years. And another was Alex Mombaris, uh, a Greek guy, comrade, who went in with his French wife. And he was sentenced to 12 years, managed to escape from prison with two South African political prisoners after seven years. But this is what internationalism is. It's this kind of solidarity. It's a two-way street. It's what our world needs today yeah. more than ever. Yeah. And this is what... Great book, and we really ask you to support it, to buy it. These guys aren't going to make money out of it. Um, royalties go to the Nelson Mandela Children's Fund. Thank you. Okay, great. Thanks very much. I, I, unfortunately, Ken Keeble's not here, and Ken's become an expert on the bucket bomb. I think he even drew a, a picture of the bucket bomb in the book. I think Ken drew that picture, yes, didn't he? Yes. And so I just have to do a little bit of what he would have done, just because it's really important to understand what we were trained to do. On Hampstead Heath, we were trained, to, first of all, to assemble a bucket bomb, which was, you buy the plastic bucket, the leaflets are then placed on a timing device that literally does explode, explodes the bucket, explodes 10,000 leaflets into the air. And the idea is, in our false bottom suitcases, we take the leaflets in the, in the, in, in the suitcases, go all over South Africa once they've arrived, buy the plastic bucket at the equivalent, or actually literally Woolworths, and then assemble the plastic buckets in our hotel rooms, and Bob here will tell a particular story about that in a few minutes, and then go to our particular destinations. And it's on a timing device, and there's a ticker. That's very important about the ticker. That's a little bit of background. Now, at this point, I want to thank British imperialism for my middle-class English accent. Um, Ang the leaders of anglo jury in this country worked very hard to make sure that third, fourth generation of British Jews had very nice English middle class accents. <laughs> and believe me, this was incredibly important. Uh, Mike Malott, who's my co oh, by the way, my two co-conspirators, Mike Malott and uh, George Pizer, are over there. And they've both got hair and I don't, which is not terribly fair. But anyway, Mike there with the slightly more grey hair has written a brilliant piece on page 98 that describes the following. We're sitting in the bus station at Durban, waiting to take, I think it's three buckets, 
to a particular point, the time has been set, and we're going to go and set these things off. And to our horror, three policemen come forward and ask us to roll down the window. And they see these three parcels they are in brown paper parcels. What were they? They, didn't want to, they wanted to know what they were. And Mike described, I can't remember the ticking, but Mike says the ticking was really loud. <laughs> and uh, I've rolled the window down, and they're kind of just about to lean over. And Mike describes this. I actually hardly remember it. Mike describes me putting my arm down on the policeman's arm and saying, we're British tourists, don't worry, officer, or what's that effect? And they backed off. <laughs> they backed off. It was, it was actually, the most, it remains, obviously, for the most amazing moment in my life because it, I was two seconds away from, from, from Sean Hosey and the rest of the two guys that got done, and we would definitely gone to prison for a very long time. And it's just actually terribly sad. I assume these were Africana policemen, and it's a bit pathetic that an English middle class accent intimidated these Africana policemen. I mean, it shows you how bloody powerful the British Empire was. It's quite <laughs> tragic. But momentarily, that's good news. Anyway, so that's, uh, that, that, that's a, 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 an amazing moment, and the, for me, obviously, the most, uh, and for Mike, the most astonishing moment. I met Ronnie at the LSE, and I haven't got time to tell the story properly. He was in my sociology class. I was a genuine student. He bloody well wasn't. <laughs> he, was he was pretending to be. And he was the first person I heard complain about Max Weber. He, neither of us had heard of him. But Ronnie picked up immediately this guy's anti-Marxist. That was enough for him. I were learning about him. Um, and so he went on. We developed this relationship. I can't do it justice. The LSE at the time was the vanguard of the student movement. The international socialists... More or less had the leadership of the student movement. It was enormous. We had hundreds and hundreds of supporters as, they develop, as, as it developed. And South Africa was very important because the student sitting was triggered by the attempt to appoint a director from White Rhodesia, as it was then, before Zimbabwe. That's what triggered, tr triggered the student movement at the LSE. And it was highly political. It was intensely political. Political arguments about everything. And I describe this in the book. I also describe the relationship between Ronnie Caswell and Tony Cliff, the founder of the SWP, and their impact on me, both of them as professional revolutionaries and from Jewish origins. That's a dimension I can't begin to discuss here, but I do discuss it in the book, and it's incredibly important. But Ronnie and I, and Ronnie was arguing all the time with the trots, and he was the only Stalinist, and there is a kind of irony that he did make a revolution. We've yet to make a bloody revolution. <laughs> that is extreme, that's extremely annoying, but it's a fact. It's a fact. And actually, you can see from his demeanour, and it's an astonishing demeanour, I mentioned it this morning, he remained just like he, you see him now, whatever the pressures and the tensions, he remained this kind of affable guy that never seemed to get rattled, Extra absolutely extraordinary, remained, I'm sure he must have been occasions he got rattled, I never saw him once get rattled. He set this up, and I'm, I'm, I'm absolutely delighted to have taken part. I want to mention two political, and I'm really close to the 12 minutes, I want to mention two really serious political points that grow out of this. The first one is, the student movement, Tony Cliff, and Ronnie agrees with him, and we all agree with him now, went off like a rocket, that was exciting, then came down like a stick, plop. And that happened really quickly. Ronnie mentioned the French events, the, the Paris, the, the, the 10 million workers on strike and the students fighting in, in the streets of Paris and the student occupations, that was the high point. We'd all become revolutionary socialists. We all thought the revolution was going to happen then and there. We took it for granted. It's about to happen in France. It's nearly happened. It's bound to spread to Britain just a matter of weeks or months. And, of course, we're still waiting. Um, but actually, conditions are rather more favourable in all sorts of ways, and that's what this whole weekend is about. But the point being, the demoralisation set in very, very quickly, and it was incredibly frustrating. In a sense, the, the, the possibility of continuing revolutionary activity in this extraordinary way that we've begun to outline this evening was incredibly attractive. That was a factor, in, uh, a central factor in, uh, in wanting to do this. And of course, there is an adventure element. Obviously, there was an adventure element. It was a kind of challenge to do this. And, um, but the, kind of the politics grew very much out of the student movement. But there's another fact which I want to end on, which I never realised fully until I read the book myself, because obviously, I first met the other recruits at the South African Embassy in, in 2005. By, but obviously, the question of secrecy was very important. I, knew, I didn't actually know, even know all the LSE students that Ronnie was talking to. I knew none of the members of the Young Communist League, and they obviously formed the majority. Having read the book, there's another political dimension that really fascinates me now. One of the great demands of the revolutionary student movement was the Student Worker Alliance. I now realise that the alliance between the revolutionary socialists at the LSE, who, went on, who became London recruits, and the Young Communist League, that actually was a student worker alliance. Because I think every single one of the YCL came from working class backgrounds. There's some extraordinary stories, and I, you know, 
just to illustrate this, one of the most amazing things that Romney tried, doesn't actually didn't come off, was to recruit seamen to actually take a ship full of uh, smuggled uh, uh, guerrillas around the South African coast in South Africa. Now, that didn't come off, but the story is told there. That's one of the most sensational examples. The story I particularly like, though, there's two brothers, I think the Bell brothers, who are proposing as, posing as businessmen, members of the Young Communist League, and they're in a bar talking to other white businessmen, and the name Jack Dash comes up, who was a famous communist dockers leader in the late 60s, and these other white businessmen were slagging Jack Dash off, and one of the Bell brothers said, hey, no, hang on a minute, Jack Dash is really good, oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, but they got away with it by saying, what, what I meant me to say was that we have to be really, we sometimes have to respect our opponents, and these idiots, other businessmen, kind of, okay, accepted that. But the book's full of these anecdotes. The, bu the book's full of these anecdotes, and I do hope you will buy it. And I do regard this as, the f for me, it was the first of many very important revolutionary activities. I'm very pleased I'm still here to tell the tale. I'll start by saying I'm not Jewish. <laughs> I'm not a trot, but I was young once. <laughs> it was an amazing experience, an amazing privilege to have the opportunity to participate in this particular struggle. And we had no idea... I think at the time, how important, what a critical moment it was for the South African struggle. That's a very serious point. There were some amazing events that took place. John's reflected on a few. Um, he talked about a hotel room. You know, we were quite unsophisticated, we'd had a little bit of training. We all in the books say we were well trained, <laughs> because we didn't want to embarrass ourselves or, or Ronnie, but the training was rudimentary and the devices were rudimentary. And, uh, there were two, two, two really amazing stories. One, uh, two, two of the comrades concerned had set their device up, was all ready to go and just checking it and so on, and it started... Before they got to it, bang, and it's gone off. And the hotel room's absolutely full of smoke. They opened the windows, shouting, fire, fire. Fortunately, there was a festival on, a, uh, a religious festival on, and there were fireworks going off. People come up to them and said, what's going on, what's going on? I said, it's okay, you know, there's firework coming, but it's all right, we've got it sorted. And when they, they tidied everything away, hid it under the bed and everything, and sorted it out later, when they got up in the morning, the roof is covered with, the ceiling of the room is covered with black smoke, and there's leaflets hanging off the top of the wardrobes. But anyway, no problem. <laughs> Two of the guys have got everything laid out. They've got the, the, the buckets all set up, and the platforms there, they've got the leaflets there, they've got this here, that there. They're all ready to put it together for the next day. Door opens, in walks the maid. <coughs> ah! What do we do? Quick, look at each other. There's two things. Do we just walk out the door, run and get on the first plane and disappear? Or do we try and work it out? And they took the decision on the spot. Tell her what's going on. Tell her we're here to support you, to help you. These are leaflets. Give her a leaflet and hope. And she sort of smiled, nodded, went out. They got it all ready and they thought, are they going to be coming in the morning? Are they going to be waiting for us when we walk out the hotel? Anyway, they went on, they did it, and nothing. And they were back in uh, Durban with us last month uh, for the book launch in South Africa and did seek to try and find that person because that person not only saved their lives but probably a lot of other people's as well. Um, and it was a, you know, a fascinating description of the interrelationship between the people involved and, the, uh, 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 and those that were working to help. John talked about internationalism. I'd like to add another ingredient to that, because what we have here, I came from the Young Communist League. I was a young working class lad. I was unemployed at the time. I first went out. But what we had here was people from two very distinct and quite opposed political perspectives on the left, working together in a common cause, not knowingly. <laughs> But a tremendous <laughs> result. Um, I will finish on a couple of other things, but I want to make sure that I say that I think however much we disagree and however much we interpret key moments in history in different ways, and we do and we will continue to do so inevitably, the one lesson that we must take is that together we are much stronger, as we tell everybody else, yeah. and apart we are weaker. And this was a gain a result that Ronnie, by going to all sorts of people in all sorts of different ways, achieved a result that was much greater than could have been achieved otherwise. So we must never forget that. And divisions on the left are only to our 
detriment and the detriment of our class and our struggle. A couple of things to finish. Yeah. I was involved in that, after the leaflet bombings, I went back with Alex Mumbaris in the project to bring the ship down to Somalia and land ANC fighters on the coast and we were there to meet them with a number of other people and, and ship them in. Um, as was said, it, it didn't uh, in the event happen because the ship as it happened, kept breaking down. It was a national <laughs> ship, bought with very little money. Some really wonderful English seamen comrades tried their utmost to nurse it along and got it going, and it kept failing. Got it going. We were there for three weeks, but actually we were there for eight weeks. Uh, and it was quite a, an amazing experience trying to move from place to place to place, because we'd got there, we'd covered, got our cover, we're staying in a place two weeks. Yeah, okay, lovely. Oh, oops, no, we're not. Let's move somewhere else. So lots and lots and lots of unplanned things happened all the time. But what was absolutely extraordinary was the degree of, to which the um, training and support that we'd given before we went allowed us to constantly change the program. But one thing we could never really understand, and, 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 and it's already been reflected upon, how different South Africa was than Britain. It worked to our advantage at times, but we were there. We stayed in a holiday cottage. The maid, we have a maid, the maid comes. I'll do your shopping for you because I can get everything you want cheaper. I'll do your cooking for you. You shouldn't have to cook. And we're wondering, should we say yes or no to this? Johnny, you didn't tell us the answer to that before. <laughs> Are we going to expose ourselves by saying no or yes? Every single moment of every day, we were confronted with a completely new question that we had to, to grapple with and to, to address. I will finish by saying that there are a number of the recruits here and I'm sure they may make some comments along the way and when we have questions and discussion uh, reflect upon their, their experiences and, and what it meant for them. But I want to end reiterating the point that Ronnie made. We had no idea when we went out there what a critical moment it was for our comrades in South Africa for that struggle just how crushed they were, because of course they would not and could not broadcast that fact. It wasn't shared with us. We were just asked, can you help out, do something? Pete Smith, who sits in the wall over there, one of my comrades in the YCL, I shared various flats with him on, over a number of years before going to South Africa. And one night he says to me, Bob, you need to take a walk. What? We'd never gone for a walk before. We'd done all sorts of interesting things together in struggle and in social uh, activity. We walk over the park, he says, I need to have a conversation with you. He said, you've been selected for a very special task. I never even thought of asking who selected me. I never have asked him. <laughs> <laughs> he said, some of our comrades have done some internationalist duty for the comrades, for some comrades elsewhere. Didn't tell me where. He said, uh, you've been selected to help, will you? I thought about it and I thought, well, I would trust Pete. Pete says he's done it, I can do it. So I said, yes. He wouldn't tell me what it was until I said yes. Then he said, well, it was for South Africa, and then it went on from there. But the important thing was, I think, for all of us there, obviously in this day and age with all sorts of other people doing all sorts of things that we may not approve of, as well as those that we would very much support, we had to perhaps be more cautious than we were as young people then, when someone approaches you to do something that you're not sure about. But the key thing was, as communists, as socialists, as internationalists, and I'll include us all in that, without hesitation, there was no hesitation, Ronnie said it, none of the people that were asked said no. It seemed a natural thing to do, to add to what we did in our own struggle, and to do something more for someone else. And the, the point I wanted to make then about the visit we made recently in launching the in South Africa, people come up to us all the time and said, thank you very much, you did so much for us. But actually, the key message from the success of the end of apartheid and the opportunities that has created for the future of South Africa, and there's a long way to go, and none of us would argue about that, the possibility of a, a, a future for the people of South Africa now exists. That once, now that system has been destroyed. The 
key moment was to be able to be a part of that and that their victory was very much a part of our victory. What it did to our anti-racist struggle in Britain, mm -hmm. and we are confronted with all sorts of aspects of that today, but we were all involved in it then, which brought us into that struggle. Their victory against apartheid brought back to us a tremendous power and strength to confront and take forward that struggle. So we don't exist in isolation. We are in this together, if you like. We're in it together. We know the others aren't. <laughs> uh, and that really is the message I'd like to finish on. Thank you. South African by okay. Um I just want to say thank you. Okay, what you guys did means a lot to every one of us. Okay. You forget to mention your broadcast through Radio Lusaka. I unfortunately wasn't at Warwick Avenue bus station to pick up a leaflet. But that little information that you ran around from radio station to radio station that we could pick up little bit of news that was really happening made a huge amount of difference to us. Okay? I got told when I was young at school, okay? Young men, you must learn to shut your mouth because things are never going to effing change in this country. That's what I was told. And because I listened to you guys, my reply was this. If I'm going to continue to be te taught by bigots like you, things will never change. I stood my ground because you guys stood there. And uh, my daughter goes to the same Woodcraft folk group as um, Sean Hosey's daughter. Um, I also, I had some trouble with housing benefit a year or so back. Sean was very, at that point, quite a senior member of staff in um, housing benefits in Sheffield. He, he retired by that point, actually. He offered to come and represent me. Came along, represented me. Now, he, he does a lot of work for the Citizens Advice Bureau. It was fantastic. Actually, uh, it was very successful. I got uh, some money back off them and apologies instead of me owing them money. Fantastic. We talked a lot of politics while this was going on and we disagreed about some things. We, we agreed about a lot more. But what was interesting was I didn't know any of this until I read the book. Um, never mentioned it. And I think the humility of that is absolutely incredible. Um, you know, I, I think that a lot of people had they done half of of what Sean and, and the other comrades here did would rightly want to talk about it. Um, so that that was incredible to me. So I've been pleased by the book and read the book because the stories in there are absolutely amazing. And to think that this was someone who, you know, I know socially, I've got a political relationship with him, he didn't tell me, or as far as I know, any, anybody else that you know socially about that part of his life. I think it's quite incredible. I mean, the other the other thing that we did together last year was get um, some of the young students to come to talk to the, the 12, 13, 14-year-olds in this Woodcraft group about student struggles. So this is someone who's still politically engaged, still um, politically very positive. Um, but, you know, I just, I just want to pay tribute to the humility of the person. And, and having read what happened now, please buy the book, read the stories. So I think that's incredible. I think it's a shame you couldn't be here tonight, but um, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll take back the experiences of this meeting and tell them about it. Well, I, I have both a, a personal and a political interest in this story because two of the heroes, John, at least two, John and Mike over there, and George as well, I think for a time, were inmates in my house uh, in North London at the time. And uh, it was quite mysterious. I think they, they disappeared for a, a week or two, uh, on more than one occasion. And I said, well, where are you going? And they said, well, we're going on holiday. <laughs> but uh, the luggage they took didn't seem to be fully appropriate to a holiday. I think they took some bathing trucks, but uh, uh, otherwise it was more serious uh, clothing. But I want to, on a more serious note, I mean, we have to applaud... The, the heroism of, of these guys, because, I mean, it was extraordinary what they did. They could have been put away for a long time, as Ronnie reminded us. Um, but also, we go over these stories of the past, um, both because of, out of interest in what happened, but also to draw the lessons for the present. And 
The lessons for the present is, as Ronnie and John have said, is the question of international solidarity. South Africa was one of the nastiest settler colonial states in the world. It's gone. That's the settler colonial state has gone. In Northern Ireland, the sectarian state has gone. There is one remaining settler colonial state, and that is Palestine, Israel-Palestine. And here we have to really apply the lessons of past struggles in order really to see how we can build a maximum solidarity to assist the Palestinian people in their struggle for national liberation. I'm sure comrades know the situation in Palestine. You know, a Palestinian giving out a leaflet can be seized by the Israeli army, the Israeli security, and be put away uh, on the grounds of you know, security risk, what, what you know, they call it you know, the detention, uh, for an indefinite period. And I think Ronnie himself is on record of ha as having said that the situation of the Palestinians is almost worse than South Africa. Uh, you know, South Africa, the, the, the black people were, in one sense, were part of the society because they were super exploited. In Palestine, the Zionist movement always excluded the Palestinians. They, had, they were not supposed to have any place in the, uh, 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 the Zionist society. So there's a lot we can do here, but there's a lot we can do by going over there. Um, you know, there are twinning groups that, that are around. Um, you know, it's, it's terribly important to, to build solidarity here, but to go over there and to bring Palestinians over here. These things are possible, and it plays an enormous role in building, helping the Palestinians to raise their level of morale and thereby to enhance their, you know, the, the level of resistance. In fact, I once, once asked a Palestinian comrade, you know, who's in, involved with the twinning, uh, the twinning um, campaign. I said, you know, people here march for Palestine. They go leaflet for Palestine, you know, the boycott of Israeli goods campaign. They come over here to Palestine. What does it mean to you? And he thought for a moment and he said, it gives the people hope. Thank you. Very, very short question, really, to Ronnie. Um, were there any doubts about you recruiting trots? <laughs> did, you, did you get any flag? <laughs> I can't believe that nobody said anything to you, especially us lot. It's just to say that <clears throat> the, the accounts in the book and the events <clears throat> inevitably are personalised because <clears throat> individuals were involved in this. Um, but what I want to say, first of all, is that in a situation of the most vicious repression, which is what pertained at the time, there's always something that people on the outside can do to help. We don't have to be passive. You know, this sense of passivity, which you find very frequently nowadays, <clears throat> I think these events are an example of how you don't have to be passive. And there's always something, <clears throat> something you can do. International solidarity is always possible, and ordinary people will always be ready to respond to positive initiatives to resist oppression, both then and now. <clears throat> I was a bag carrier in, this, in these events, all right. Nothing as exciting and adventurous as um, what's been recounted tonight. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, I had been politicized through um, uh, Colic Harlech, which is a, a workers' education college in North Wales. I was born and brought up in Wales. Then I went to the University of York in the golden years of 68 to 71, okay? And, um, of course, we had student sit-ins and so on. Um, and that has a major politicising effect. And I joined the IS at, in 1970 and, of course, the SWP later on and was involved in all, all the campaigns subsequently. This is the first time I've spoken about these events, because these were erased from memory, really, for years and years and years, quite rightly so, all right. Um, I was involved in the Notting Hill Community Workshop in the end of the early 70s, <clears throat> early, uh, late 60s, and it was kind of through some of those events that um, someone asked me, <clears throat> would I go, myself and another person. We didn't have exploding buckets, but we did have, <clears throat> it was... Um, clandestine, you had to be very secretive about how you went and so on. And um, there was a text for a leaflet in the suitcase and um, we duplicated the leaflets there in the hotel room. Um, the Ronio machine which was used 
um, the person who went with me, who knew about machines, right, he went out and bought the spare parts from different places, fairly clandestinely, obviously, because it was very important not to arouse uh, suspicion from any source. And so he brought them back, and the machine was put together, and we, in the old-fashioned way of duplicating, we duplicated the leaflets from the single text that we brought. And we put the leaflets in envelopes. And then um, we, in a hired car, rushed around um, the city, post putting them in post boxes. All right. And, and that was it. So, you know, not, yeah, it, it was kind of simple and direct. But I just hope, it, you know, that it might have contributed to um, uh, some of, you know... The, the, we had no idea that there were other, other people doing much more dangerous things, actually. You know, really hair-raising things that, in the book, you know, if they were very brave people to have, to have gone through all that. Um, and as a bag carrier, <laughs> I appreciate uh, that. But, um, and, you know, I don't know why I'm speaking about it now, because it's no, it's no big deal. The point is, I think, that anybody can do something in a situation of repression, okay? And we can all, it doesn't have to be LSE students, um, it can be ordinary. Yeah. <laughs> It can be women, you know, it can be girls, women, you know, someone you pass on the street, okay, you know, and uh, that potential is there for everybody to do something, okay, and that it's very important to remember that, I think, in this day and age. Well, the story that uh, Bob told, uh, I have to confess it was me, uh, that was in the hotel room, um, surrounded by leaflets by <laughs> buckets by pieces of wood and soldering iron and the place was like a factory and I was very young I had never stayed in a hotel I had no idea what a hotel was like so I locked the I shut the door and I locked it and I thought so that's that's fine that's done it never occurred to me that somebody else might have a key and just <laughs> and just walk in um, and yet there was a chambermaid who opened the door and walked in to do the beds or whatever. And we were astounded. We could not believe our eyes, and nor could she. <laughs> and we all, three of us, just froze in horror. I mean, she couldn't believe her eyes, and we didn't know what on earth we were to do. And um, we had been trained, but not for that particular eventuality. <laughs> um, so we really were just frozen for a, for a moment until she just turned and walked out and didn't do anything in the room. Uh, you know, the beds were not <laughs> ready to be made, so she just walked out. And we didn't panic, but we were terrified. Yeah, so, uh, and that's when we did what we did. That was the right thing or the wrong thing. As it turned out, we got away with it. But um, we were scared, and um, we hoped that she would not... Um, talk, she would not inform on us, she wouldn't tell anybody who would, uh, and um, we appealed to her not to, and she understood, because I showed her one of the leaflets, and which she read, and she read it very carefully and very thoroughly, and then she said, uh, you are fighting for us, she said, she understood, so at that point I thought, maybe maybe she will resist the temptation to tell somebody and and thank god she didn't because uh, who knows what would have happened then but for the next you know until we'd actually done it we were terribly nervous now it, it brings me on to the point that a lady made over there about sean not telling anybody for all these years it, it when we came back we couldn't tell anybody and and it's it was sort of inside us and it makes me sort of tearful now now, the, the reason for that, just getting myself together, sorry about this, but we've kept all that inside for a long, long time. And it's sort of difficult to talk about it. And when I met up with Dennis, who I went with, he was crying too. And um, so um, for us, this book, and um, events like this are, you know, quite important personally as well. So I'm sorry about that, um, but it's it's very emotional. 
And I think it is an indication of, although we were sort of casual in a way, um, Bob's right, uh, it was Bob Allen that asked me, would you go to South Africa? And he said, think about it. But I was just about to say yes, when he said, think about it. But actually, it took me about a second, I think, to, to agree. He said, would you be willing to go to South Africa? And I said, yeah. I was just going to say, yeah, sure. And it's very difficult to know afterward, uh, at the time, what's your motivation. Thinking back now, uh, I, I had to really think hard about, um, you know, why did I say yes so willingly? What was what was going on? And there was politics and personal stuff and all sorts. Yeah, but but um, that um, the, that when we went, although we went, we said that say we agreed casually, if you like, quickly without too much thought. When we were there. It was very tense. It was very. Uh, we had to hold a lot of fear and a lot of other emotions inside, and then keep them there for the next forty years. And um, I think that's why when I met up with Dennis just recently before the trip to South Africa, we were both very emotional. He was crying too, and it was very. You know, it was it was um, it was a relief. So I just wanted to say thanks, really, to Ken. Uh, who's not here, but anyway, but also to Ronnie and to all the other contributors, everybody that's had a part in the book, because it's uh, been wonderful to read about all the others and also to have the chance to to talk about it again after all these years. And um, uh, and just to say, um, the, my um, if you look on YouTube, Tell about the you'll see my suitcase. Yes, I kept that suitcase. <laughs> For uh, all this time, I kept it until I got an email from George saying, will you give up your suitcase? <laughs> oh, I didn't want to, I must admit. I really didn't want to. I'd kept it all that time. But uh, anyway, I did. And they took it, uh, George and Bob and the others, took it off to South Africa. And it did a tour of South Africa. <laughs> and it was very popular. It was very popular. It was uh, photographed and filmed and was on TV and, and everything. <laughs> Uh, and is now in the Rivonia Museum. And, and I feel very proud to think that um, my suitcase is in such a, <laughs> such a wonderful place. And, uh, <laughs> my name is Ayan Kota uh, from South Africa, Grimsdown. I am the member of the Unemployed People's Movement. As a young man from South Africa, uh, who lived, who grew up uh, under that period of apartheid, who have also experienced the state of emergency during that time, when people went missing with no account, that in the evening you were not safe in the dark to go out alone. Otherwise, you'll be just taken, you may that, and there'll be no account. Growing under such conditions, I think it is only fair and important to say thanks to the London recruits. Could it not have been them? Maybe we'd still be, strang uh, be struggling up until this day. Also to say thanks to Comrade Ronnie. But again, to say to Comrade Ronnie, this meeting, the people that helped you carry out that task were not just like any other people. We were Marxists. Majority of them were Trotskys. To say to Comrade Ronnie, Today, we have an excessive amount of poverty. Unemployment rate is hovering around 40%. It has reached alarming proportion. There are movements like UPM, anti-privatization, that we are fighting against the commodification of essential services like water. But also to be able to say we struggle and struggle for the staple food. That on Sunday, 
you'll have all these big corporations going to the church and praying. Then after, they will fix the price of the bread that we, cannot ha we can hardly afford the staple food. Today we know what, what it is for your kids to cry, yet you cannot afford the bread. Going out of this meeting, maybe my appeal to Comrade Roni, to do this reflection and say it was not like anyone who, was help, who helped me to fight against the apartheid. It was Marxists, it was the Trotskys. They are both prophets. They are both commodification of essential services. They are both inequalities. They are both homophobia. What needs to be done? Thank you very much. Um, I remember going in one day to my um, parents' flat in uh, Hoban, where I lived, and, and there was a phone call from the airport because Kenny had forgotten his ticket to go to Johannesburg. And it's the first time they had that. So he was, uh, he was going to, he was, he was going, so you know, a bit of a mystery. Um, and uh, so it was really frightening, actually. Um, but then he's kept it secret all the way till 2005. And that's right, because he you know, decided he must tell the story. And I'm so glad that he did this and organised people together um, and sorted out all the other people. Uh, incidentally, um, he tells me that he found three people who did say no. Um, so they, we say that you know, almost all the people who were asked said, said yes to it, but there were one or two said no, of course. But I think, see, there's a difference between um, when, when the last speaker said uh, these are Marxists and Trotskyists and so on. Um, that's largely true. The key thing for me there was the, the, the fact that Ronnie came from Communist Party, oh, South African Communist Party, it's SACP, isn't it? Get it right. South African Communist Party, right? And through the Communist Party of Great Britain, the old official Communist Party, and to that, the Young Communist League, most of them came that way. And, um, and then there was Ronnie's personal contact through the students, isn't it? In, in um, SOAS. LSE. Uh, LSE, I beg your pardon, in LSE, yeah. But, but um, the, the task of recruiting people was passed from one general uh, London district secretary to another, wasn't it? When there was a, I think it's George, isn't it? Yeah, I'm just about recognised. But so, so when it, you get a new district secretary, for, for London, and then he t suddenly, surprise, inherits the job, right? Yeah. That, that's... <laughs> the only job in advance, though. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. Isn't that extraordinary? But along with that, that, that's the importance of having... I mean, well, there's a couple of points there. One is that the old official Communist Party wasn't entirely a waste of time, <laughs> was it? Right? It had people like that in it, you know, and it, what a bloody shame that we're all organised separately. I'm, I'm for Marxist unity, right? We should be organised together, not separately. But the, the other parallel point is that some of the people who went were not Marxist revolutionaries at all. And in the atmosphere of, this, of the uh, late 60s, right, you ask any person in London, you know, well, I say any, but I mean, a mass of ordinary people in London, you ask them that job, will you do something to get rid of our apartheid? And they'll say yes. Right? There were ordinary people do that. So it, it doesn't, you know, that's, that's a different atmosphere, isn't it, where of confidence, if you like, of what can be uh, achieved. Last thing I wanted to ask uh, Ronnie, I mean, there's been a lot of talk in some of the meetings about Syriza. They might win in six months in Greece. They might get a majority and 40 extra seats and all that, and you might have a, a Syriza government. So the question is, under what circumstances... Do Marxist revolutionaries take part in government? Because the South African government leaves a lot to be desired. And uh, I'd like to tell us what you think about that. Thanks. My name's Bob Allen, and I followed on from George Bridges as London YCL District Secretary. <clears throat> I should say, by the way, that I was born and brought up in a small mining village in the East Midlands. You may remember the name. Kimberley. And uh, we were brought up with very strong values uh, because my dad was a lifelong communist. But the most important thing he taught us was to question because he always used to say it's not about knowing the answers, it's about asking the right questions. 
And having asked the questions, then acting. Working out a plan, not always a cunning plan, and then acting on that plan. We might come from a range of different traditions, but I, I sense from tonight's meeting we share something very much in common, namely those values of equality, of fairness and justice and solidarity and internationalism. It's almost instinctive. But I was privileged to recruit young because at the time I was in my early 20s, and of course, obviously I knew it all, I'd got it all boxed <laughs> off, analysed, worked out, and so on. At least that's what the Wasi and the party told me, and who was I to question that? Well, I did quite often, but there we go. <laughs> but two little bits. First of all, the process of recruiting the volunteers to go out there and do the business. And then the second bit, what kind of flows from that in terms of lessons. The extraordinary thing was that when Jack Waddis and George said to me, oh, by the way, there's another part of your job description uh, you need to know about, that wasn't a discussion along the lines of, uh, were you prepared to take this on? It, I was informed as to this other aspect of my job. <laughs> and, and it was to recruit these volunteers. So you'd have, periodically, a discussion with an individual all around the houses, well, would you be up for doing something a bit off the wall, maybe a little bit illegal, uh, possibly abroad, and so on and so forth. <laughs> and uh, you got some fairly interesting facial expressions. But then you came to the crunch question, and the response was the same. Yeah, I'm up for that. I'll do that. I then had to have a meeting, secret meeting, in public with Ronnie in a pub, and I'd pass on the name and details. I have to tell you, as a committed communist and revolutionary all my life, I went through the full gamut of emotions, because at the end of the day, I had some responsibility for that person who was going out there. And you can dress up all the rhetoric, you can come up with all the fancy theory and analysis and all the rest of it, but at the end of the day, this was a person sharing the same values as me, but was choosing to act. Fortunately for me, they all came back safe and well, so I could breathe a sigh of relief. And like George, because we were high profile, because we were full-time officials, uh, we couldn't go. But we were sending guys out there uh, to do something very dangerous. As far as the lesson, uh, lessons... Uh, are concerned. One, internationalism works. It's not just a slogan, it works. And when we say their victory is our victory, that's absolutely true. And the victory over apartheid meant our hands were stronger in the struggle back here in uh, 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 Europe. And Secondly, we might have and we need to have ongoing vigorous debates about questions of tactics and strategy and all the rest of it. But the most important thing is that we do resist. We do use those values as a basis to act and then we try and maximise our uh, 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 unity in order to make that action as effective uh, 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 as possible. And the last point, going back to my dad... Uh, I'm often asked uh, in this modern, in these new times, because as you can see, I'm not quite as young as I used to be. Well, I am fairly young. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, globalisation, uh, neoliberalism, all the attacks on the working class to pay for the bankers uh, created crisis and all the rest of it. My answer is straightforward. There's no change. There's nothing to be gained from pessimism. I remain an idealist, I remain an optimist, because I know, and the struggle against apartheid is a classic illustration, when you do stand together, when you do act together, we win. Or as my dad put it, sometimes you fight and you may not get the right result, but if you stand on the sidelines, you lose. 
This one we won. It's been a brilliant meeting. <laughs> um, I literally didn't really understand. I haven't read the timetable fully enough. I didn't really go through all of my meetings for this afternoon or this evening, what I was going to be doing. I've been busy with all kinds of other stuff. And when I sat down in the 20, 30 minutes before this meeting started, when I heard what it was about and actually looked at the title and thought of it a little bit about it, I was like, oh my God, this is clearly the meeting that I want to go to. And I haven't been disappointed. I think it's been incredibly inspiring and um, very, very much like, I think, sort of someone who's only been politically active in the last couple of years, looking at guys who've been, you know, <laughs> doing the shit that you guys did is <laughs> quite significant and it you know I'm very much in awe of all of, of all of you but I also think there's like it, for there's a lot of there's a lot of young people like me who are just thinking oh my days this is incredible sitting in this room and I think there's an important thing for us as well to take from that because actually the kind of repression that was seen in apartheid South Africa and I think Sabi said it really well what, and what our Palestinian brothers and sisters are undergoing is something that isn't going to go away because when those fuckers really want to shit on us, they will shit on us. And if that means that they want to stop us from organising, they will do their utmost to do it. And actually, I think what we see here is an incredible amount of bravery and the importance of solidarity as well. And actually, what solidarity means in the darkest of hours. And that is something that we need to seriously take forward. And we also need to realise that as we look forward in these times coming up as well, when we're looking at as the struggle intensifies, we already have police battering kids on our streets when they rise up. We already have riots on the streets of London and across the country where kids are, the, are expressing the anger of their whole lives being in the gutter. And I think we have to look ahead and start to see that this era that we're in is an era that all of these guys talked about from 1968 to the early 70s to the fights against colonialism and the fight for international liberation in reality. And that's what internationalism is about. But we have to see that as a thread which is now happening right across the world. And I think to all the young uh, <coughs> revolutionaries in this room, um, I'm going to do an open plug. You should join the SWP. Um, I remember, I've been a member two years and I know what I'm going to be doing as soon as this is over, after Marxism, I'm going back because I've got Nazis coming to Walthamstow and we're going to fuck them up. Um, it's just a quick question, really. Um, my friend Job, uh, who I met when I was at um, university, um, gave me a book by you and wanted me to really understand um, the struggle that you'd been part of because his parents were involved in it. He's called Job Rabkin and it was Syrian David Rabkin. Mm -hmm. And they did get arrested as well. I don't know if they're in this book or quite how they got recruited, but um, David didn't, then went in, um, into Angola and died. Um, so I just wanted to sort of... I asked Franny. Franny in, um, Franny's in town at the moment. She lives yeah. in South Africa. Um, and Job lives here. I asked him to come along, but I don't know to make it. Sure, I just wanted to remember to David Rankin. Sure, I, I get the feeling partly in this meeting there's something of a baton being passed on. Because I, I, someone... I'm not the youngest in the room, but even someone my age really doesn't have this personal experience of what the Communist Party and what the YCL meant for people. Um, how organised, internationalist, um, based in the trade unions, the, the, an organisation that whatever political criticisms you might have at this point or another, it was really a home for people who wanted to fight, people who were concerned about uh, apartheid, and people who wanted to change, change the system. And I think we should, yeah, uh, all criticism aside, all criticism aside, we should look back at this period and, and really be thankful that during the 60s and the 70s, the organisations like the Communist Party and the YCL, uh, uh, YCL were there, that they were able to bring committed very many working class people together um, who could, at the, uh, at the drop of a hat, say, can you go to South Africa and, ri and risk being arrested and risk your life uh, because for, the, for the cause? And they would, say, they, they would say yes. And I think the experiences which we've learned from all the people from the Communist Party and the YCL today is something which gives us a lot of responsibility, that, uh, that we need to prove ourselves as socialists, in the, as socialists now to be at least as worthy as they were when they were confronted with their 
with, with what they were com uh, com com confronted with. And I think we need to sort of sit back and look at, look at, look at history, history a bit and say it's not always... Um, okay, I'll say it another way. You can have the perfect program, you can have the perfect ideas, you can know everything that's wrong with society and everything that you need to change it. But unless you have the dedicated people who are going to change the world, then, 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 that's, then that's irrelevant. And looking back on organisations which are able to motivate, uh, motivate people and organise people in terms of actually changing the world, there's a lot we can, that we can, learn, we can learn from other, from other people, whatever the tradition. And I, I think I say the people here should really take the baton on from the people who, who are active in the, in the 60s and 70s and go forward with it and prove that we, we can do as much as they, they have, and if, if not more. I think, like everybody else, I, I found this a, a, an absolutely tremendous, inspiring meeting and also a very moving meeting. And, you know, um, in some ways, I've got to express a degree of shame because, really, when you see and listen to comrades from an entirely different tradition to ours, and a tradition which, you know, let's be honest, you know, uh, we would describe as being a river of blood between the two, I think we've got to recognise that there's something that binds us together, and that is a commitment, as the comrades have said, to the basic ideas of struggle of solidarity. Um, when, I, 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 when I was at university in, in, in Newcastle, there was a guy there from Namibia who was on the Central Committee of SWAPO, and he asked me if I would like to go and uh, lecture in the uh, Lusaka Institute, um, uh, in the Namibian Institute in Lusaka. Um, and he said, you'd be six months in the lecture theatre, and then you'll be six months out with us. And um, when I read that the average life expectancy of a swap or gorilla was about three days, um, I wasn't overly uh, keen on doing it, and I talked to a number of comrades about what I should do. And, the, you know, to my shame, in a way, I didn't go, and I'm, you know, and I, I, I don't, I, in some ways, I don't regret not going, but the fact is that, you know, these struggles continue. And if you can't do what they did, as a number of people have said, that there's other things we can do. You know, the question of going to Israel is very important. Israel, Palestine, very, very important to go there and show solidarity. But more than anything, I think, is keeping alive the tradition of people like our comrades here today. Because I feel incredibly proud that these comrades have come along to Marxism have taken part in this because maybe they wouldn't have done it many years ago and I'm glad that they're here because actually, you know, we, we are proud of what you did. You did make a difference and the historic defeat of apartheid was one of the greatest days and I'll tell you this, I remember sitting in a real workers club in Gateshead the day Nelson Mandela was released from prison and I was sitting in, in this club and it was full of real workers who just come off a shift from the, rail, from, from the station, and Nelson Mandela came walking out of prison, and to a man, they stood up and cheered. And that victory of releasing Nelson Mandela ultimately was down to the struggling of the people on the ground in South Africa, but also, now as we know, the comrades here, so we should be immensely proud of them. I'm going to introduce our speakers to come back in, in the following order. Um, John's going to speak first, followed by Bob, and then followed by Ronnie. Thank you very much, comrades. Thank you. Thanks. I want to do one thing in this summing up, and I want to talk about the United Front and the principle of the United Front that has been expressed in this relationship in all sorts of ways. Ayanda Kota, who spoke and made the sharpest points in some ways in terms of raising questions about what's happened after the destruction of apartheid, I met Ayanda and he's staying with me for Marxism. I met him as a result of Ronnie inviting me back to South Africa three years ago. And in a way, that's an aspect of this United Front process. But there's something else I want to just explain about my contribution in the book. I don't write about the adventure side. The comrades that I went with did that. I wanted to write about Ronnie at the LSE. And I wanted to write about the political arguments that took place unambiguously, and I did so. I describe, as you'll see, the argument between Tony Cliff and Ronnie about the class character of the Soviet Union, and that Cliff's persistent, as is the founder of the SWP, who came to the LSD all the time during this period, and Ronnie was particularly isolated, but was involved in these discussions, 
And Cliff used to chase Ronnie around the corridor saying, Ronnie, Ronnie, supposing the ANC does get power with the South African Communist Party, isn't there a danger of you simply managing capitalism and allowing it to continue and to become destructive? And, Ron, and the point I'm making here, that argument's in the book, and the principle of the United Front isn't just the arguments in the book. Ronnie didn't have any hesitation at all in including it. In other words, political disagreements persist. We were united in this really important struggle, but we're having a political argument at the same time. That, for me, is the United Front. Yeah. Thank you for the opportunity just to do a little bit at the end. Ronnie was interviewed promoting the book on South African television three weeks ago. And one of the things that was asked of him was, how did you manage to get these guys together again after all this time? And he said, well, of course, they knew, all, all knew each other. One of the amazing things is that we do, did all know each other. And actually, I knew George and I knew John from different contexts. I was in and out of the LSE as well at the time, but also from the Anti-Nazi League, as well as my other comrades from the YCL and the Communist Party. But we didn't know, except for those we went with, any of the others had gone. It was the most extraordinary thing until we got together five years ago, walked through the doors of the South African High Commission and looked around the room and said, what the hell are you doing here? <laughs> <laughs> it was closed and Graham's emotion, I was really privileged to go to South Africa for, for, for a, just over a week, uh, a week ago, two weeks ago, as a part of the promotion of the book there, to receive thank yous, to have fascinating conversation and debate but to actually to be able to open up all those things that we had absolutely suppressed no one knew about it and I didn't even talk to Pete Smith about it in that 40 years and we went out together. So it was that, that absolutely close. I want to finish by saying that we didn't contribute the book to promote ourselves in any way. One of the amazing things I think about all the contributions is their humility. Comrades have just tried to explain how they came to be there, what they did and why they did it. And I think we are all agreed that we did it because we were internationalists, because presented with the offer, the opportunity, we had no choice. It was a natural extension of all of that which we did and was a, a culmination of that which we believed in and lived on a daily, day, day by day basis as part of our struggle. But it came to write in the book, I think we probably largely agreed also that we wanted to demonstrate not a historical story, but the importance of internationalism and solidarity today. To bring back, in a positive way, the real story of common struggle, joint struggle and helping each other, which had been so crushed in this last 10, 20 years under the media attacks, labelling everyone who dares to put their head up and struggle as terrorists, or communists, or anything else that can isolate them from others, or reduce their possibility or potential for struggle. So I think that was why we chose to put it there, and um, I've been overwhelmed with the positive way in which it's been picked up and taken forward and debated and discussed, exactly in line with that hope, despite some fears at the time. And thank you for having us, because it has been a great joy to be here. Well, George Pazes said to me, Ronnie, <laughs> did your leaders know you were recruiting Trotskyists side by side with the communists? And wasn't there any criticism about this? Of course, I reported that I was recruiting um, comrades out of the LSC and the largest student uh, milieu. Um, the, the YCL is that was a bit more formal in fact because we couldn't go into an organization like that and and simply recruit people without getting that accepted by George's <coughs> seniors in in fact um, after I spoke to George we, we met on a plane going to Bulgaria one of those Stalinist functions. <laughs> we both discovered we were terribly bored of the whole damn thing. <laughs> International Youth Conference on uh, you know, the Soviet era. But um, we then started talking in this creative way, you see, and he said, look, I think it's on, but I can't do anything, Ronnie, 
and unless I get the go-ahead from King Street. Um, but Joe Slovo, Yusuf Dadu, who was really viewed as, as quite a Stalinist figure, not so much Joe. Um, no, no, as long as the people concerned are clear about what they're doing, this was, was, would be fine, George. God forbid if um, we'd had the arrests of a trot <laughs> and a Stalinist, <laughs> and they'd been in that jail together. <laughs> because I'm, I'm sure that sparks would have flowed like hell there, you know, and what somebody like Dennis Goldberg, you're serving life, and Bram Fisher would have made, say, George, of you and Bob Hammer and Thomas there. Uh, and actually, they would have learnt. You know, South African Communist Party's got, and had, uh, perhaps I should look at it in the past, I'm not happy with where it is now, but the one thing that there was in that party was an incredible creativity. Um, yeah, we did tow the Soviet line for sure, and I'm, I'm not going to start uh, elucidating on that, it's not necessary here. But within the party, we had very creative people. And there was an aspect of South Africa, class was the key, but race and national struggle was part of it, which is really the secret why the Communist Party, Ayanda, and you know this, was, became so close to the ANC, because you had these two clear cleavages, the divides in South Africa, was class, and race or nation, national factor. And the Communist Party mm -hmm. showed itself very adept at understanding the national aspect and synthesizing, bringing these together, and not just focusing on the work of class as such, the working class as such, but also the national aspect of national liberation, which then became an issue of the debates and with Tony Cliff, and I, I will come back to that, I'm going to steal maybe a couple of minutes, because before coming to that, I, I just wanted to pay some tribute to the, the lovely young lady who at last I've discovered, who went in and did the Sartre styling <coughs> mission with the Sartre styling machine. Just put your hand up again so I can see where you are, because I must speak to you afterwards, and I can remember us suddenly thinking, why on earth are we sending suitcases in crammed with thousands and thousands of leaflets where we could find somebody like you and your partner <laughs> to buy a slightly styling machine? You needed a lot of time on your hands and to crank away. And that's what led to your mission in about 19, 1972 or so, which was after this particular period, <coughs> that five years, we needed, though, these, these leaflet bombs to go off, and we needed the street broadcast, and countries like Palestine would need it now, by the way. Mm, yeah. Don't accept that the electronic media can do it all, and you can just focus that way. In a fascist state, in a dictatorship, in a repressive society, the act of real street activity, of, of broadcasts going off, of leaflet bombs going off, is an incredible force. And looking back at you, George, and the young man who made a very lovely point here about he perceives the baton being passed on, the question of how we came to street broadcasts was out of the Colonel's coup in Greece, because it might have even been you talking with me or I saw it in a newspaper, but I'm sure we had a discussion. And I remember, like, on the day after, some Greek activists in Athens went into a hotel on the main square, and they booked a room, and they had a, 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 a um, <coughs> amplifier, which they put at the window, and a tape recorder, and it was a speech denouncing the coup and they left behind um, a booby trap. So that when the hotel staff, of course they vacated, switched it on, the first few minutes there was silence, they were well away. When it started blaring out in the square, 
the hotel staff and then obviously the goons came in to, to stop it, but that booby trap would have kept them at bay for, went on for a half an hour or something. I don't know if you remember that. It's passing on the battle, batter. It's generating ideas. It's the old fogies and old is great. People who I can see here together with young people will never ever accept that when you past the age of 50 or 60 or 70 that you can't contribute to the revolution. Look at Savvy here. He's a few years older than us. They really can. It's that font of knowledge and experience and not to lose the energy, as long as that energy is there, to encourage others, etc. Because the younger generation in this goddamn world we're living in with these huge contradictions of, of the 1% bossing the 99%, don't tell me that in these contradictions we can't rise up against them if we get the acts together in terms of unity of the forces, the alliances, the, the programs of action and so on. And this kind of discussion here is all part of that. It brings me to the crucial issues here of uh, Ayanda Kota and, and Ken Keeble's um, a brother, but I don't want to, just before I go to that, I don't want to lose the point about the Radkins. Uh, we've had a friend of, of Sue and, um, and her late husband, David Radkin. I just wanted to say that they're not part of the London recruits. Although Sue Radkin reminds me, she loves this book. She kills herself laughing. She wets herself as she reads this. This woman out of London who studied at Leeds, who is you know, British working class, communist family, but she joined the IS, by the way, and then married in 1970 the South African guy, Dave Radkin, who was close to the Communist Party. We recruited him, sent him back home to do the work of rebuilding our underground. And he came to me a couple of weeks before going. I had reported to Dadu and Slovo, found this incredible guy. He is so committed, he's so clear, got theory back to front, and he wants to help set up the underground. Very, very good. Two weeks before they bloody well get married and go to South Africa, he, he tells me, um, I'm actually getting married, and uh, I want you to know, and she wants to be recruited too. And I winced, because I knew that Dr. Dadu did not believe that couples should be involved together. He's a real old style guy. And he groaned and after the months and months of training David, and I come and tell him this, his face went ash and he thought, oh my God, you know, I had to say, listen, I'm gonna meet her and I'll get back and, and inform you. Anyway, we then accepted her as a recruit, but they went back into the country. They worked for several years, about five years, before they were arrested. Um, and they did enormous work. But it was, it's a different kind of, of, of category. These were the recruits from outside who came in, carried out some work for us. Some like uh, Pete Smith did, did so for many years, but Sue became a South African. And this book doesn't deal with the South Africans like David. Um, any, anyway, that's, I, I really had to to, to make that clear to you. That they, they, they performed fantastically, as did so many other members of our underground, of all races, of all backgrounds, South Africans of all backgrounds, with the black people of South Africa and the working class of South Africa leading the struggle. And uh, of course, it's using the Communist Party and being very much a part of the ANC. So you see, Ayanda, and I'll say this to Ken's brother, as I try to complete now, we, I see we on for the final time, and I, I, this, this might take a little bit of doing. Uh, let me, in shorthand to you, say that Lenin said of national liberation struggles that the character of the outcome depends on the strength of the working class. And we did believe, and I know I'd say this to Sabi and John and Chris Harmon particularly in my discussions with him, the South African working class is very powerful, Chris. It was, I had lots of discussions with Chris on this, <coughs> um, and we're going to make a revolution and we'll make socialism, but first we've got to get rid of apartheid. 
and we've, we can see how difficult it's been to move from that particular point through towards socialism, which is what we're facing, what's facing us now. Um, it's, it's a big issue. There are young people like you emerging. There are people like me who accepts and speaks openly now to my party and to the ANC and government. I'm marginalised, but I, unless they want to expel me, I'm not leaving. Because I want to talk and be heard, not just by Ayanda here, and it's very important to hear my voice, but they're very healthy elements within, and you know that, Ayanda. And that's how you and I must work. And we mustn't accept that we failed. It's very, very difficult. I know there'll be a lot of groans from the trots here, but the fact that the Soviet Union doesn't exist, and yes, Tony Cliff was right in so many ways, if it had existed, it would have given South Africa some other options. We went absolutely into the, <coughs> the, the arms of, of uh, the liberal capitalist agenda with... with the um, Mandela first, followed on by Mbeki, and followed on even more by Jacob Zuma. And, and we caught in that. Um, and this is what we've got to break out of, just like everybody else in this world. This is the real big question now. If we want to be Marxists, Trotskyists, Leninists, we've got to analyse this and try to understand, well, what is this capitalism now? And, and how do we hack away? How do we undermine it? How do we build up the forces of 99% of, of the people, but to be led by the working class, for sure? And if you get a chance, uh, uh, um, Comrade Keeble, uh, I'm not sure of the party you talked about, Malta's Unity or something. Um, the, you, you didn't catch that um, at, at all. But um, <laughs> I asked him what it was, and he says he didn't know. He's from here, and you know, but whatever it, it, whatever it is, if, uh, if, if, you get, if your forces are strong enough, and you can stand in these bloody elections, and you can win, and you can go into the parliament, I would say you must go there. Um, you know, socialists have been arguing about this for a long period of time. And we've seen what has happened in, in Britain to the Labour Party. But we shouldn't be pessimistic. We've got to look at new battlefronts. And we've got to gather our strength together and uh, take the struggle forward. So I've overshot the time, which means that what's left of me... You know, I've got, I'm, I'm going back to South Africa and I, under the likes of us, have got to say to the comrades of Britain and everywhere else, we have a contingent in South Africa that is emerging, that stands with you, and your strength helps us as the strength of the international and of international solidarity everywhere helps one another in the common fight to break the chains of imperialism and capitalism and free the world for a better world for us and for our children and grandchildren. Thank you.